Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. I've entitled my sermon today, The Revival We Need. We stand in need of a mighty move of God in this country. And it ought to start with us, God's people, amen? And so we need a revival. Habakkuk was a man that God not only did a work in his life, but gave us a word here about revival. It's good to be with you this morning. I love our pastor and I love you and I'm thankful for the opportunity to share his word. Habakkuk chapter one, beginning at verse one, where the Bible says the burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see O Lord, how long shall I cry? And thou wilt not hear. Even cry unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. Why dost dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me. And there are that raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slacked and judgment doth never go forth for the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. Now God responds to him in verse five. Behold ye among the heathen and regard Wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days which ye will not believe, though it be told you. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, we could translate that the Babylonians, that bitter and hasty nation which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not there. I want to speak this morning concerning revival. I pastored for about 26 years and I've been on the road almost 20 years preaching and cautioning people and calling folks to revival. I really believe the greatest need we have is a mighty move of God among God's people in the day that we're living. Our country's seen two great awakenings, one at the birth of our country, another in 1857. I've been so interested in revival, I went to Wales, 2004, and took a group of preachers with me celebrating the 100-year revival that took place in Wales in 1904. If God can move in Wales, and God has moved in this country in the past, My, how we need to see a mighty move of God today. Habakkuk was a man that basically his name is going to be what my sermon is about. If you study his name in the Hebrew, you'll find that his name has two connotations to it. One, his name means one who wrestles. The second thing about his name, you'll find that he's one who embraces. And so I want us to wrestle this morning and at the end of the service, after wrestling with God, may we embrace God's path and provision of revival. I have two simple points. I want to talk to you about wrestling with the vision. Look at verse 1. He says in verse 1, he says, The burden, the oracle, you could translate it, that I received from the Lord and was able to see. We could translate that word see vision. So he receives a vision from God and he wrestles with it. In fact, he's troubled about it. In fact, he has come to the place that he makes some accusations against God. You're going to find in the text that he says God is indifferent. 
God is inactive. And then after God tells him what he's going to do, he says, God, you're inconsistent. In fact, he has a problem with God. In fact, he thinks that God's taking a vacation. And God's quit doing his job of being God. Uh, there's one or two things for sure this morning. God is still God. And God will forever be the eternal sovereign God. And you can bet on it this morning that God is still up to the task of being who he is. And so when Habakkuk goes through this, he wrestles with this. Now, as we think about some things he wrestled with in the text, my first thing that you'll find that he wrestles with is a theological problem. When you study this book of Habakkuk, you'll find that every scholar to the T agrees that Habakkuk really dealt with the theological problem. Now, I'm going to use the theological term. You go to the doctor, he uses terms, and you don't get upset with him. So I'm going to make it simple for you, but he deals with the theological problem of theodicy. You say, now, what is theodicy? Well, it's the number one problem in this country. Here's what George Barna says. Now, George Barna writes all these books and does all these surveys. I've never got a call from him. Anybody ever got a call from him? Gallup's never called me. I don't understand that either. But anyway, Barna does this study, and here's what Barna said. Most people are asking this question. If God is all good, all-knowing and all-powerful. Why is there so much evil in this world? Why are, why are there tsunamis where hundreds of thousands of people are devastated? Why the Holocaust? How about rape, incest, desertion? How do we explain it? If God is all-powerful, and we've just sung about his power, if God's all-powerful, why did he put a stop to this? That's really what Habakkuk's wrestling with. Let me bring you up to date what was happening. This nation had fallen politically and socially into the hands of an evil king by the name of Jehoiakim. But it caused him to wrestle with this because what he saw under Josiah was not happening under the present king. And he says, God, how can you allow our nation to go down this highway? And seemingly evil is on the throne. It's the same problem the psalmist had in Psalm 73 when he talked about why do the evil prosper? And it seems like godly people don't really have the blessing of God. Let me recommend a book to you. If you heard me preach very much, you know I'm a bookworm. Some people are tapeworms. I happen to be a bookworm. Randy Alcorn wrote a great book on heaven. But Randy Alcorn also wrote a book called God is Good. And here's what Randy Alcorn says that Habakkuk was struggling with concerning theodicy and all of us struggle with it from time to time. He says that the culprit is not God. He said actually how God created us is the problem. You say, how did God create us? God created us, and Randy Alcorn says, with freedom of choice. And because we have freedom of choice, and by the way, Adam and Eve had freedom of choice. And if you don't believe they got you in a mess, just read 
Romans 5, 12 through 21. Because Romans 5, 12, 21 through 21 says basically this, that if you'd have been there, you'd have done what he did, so therefore you did what he did, even though you weren't there when he did what he did. And therefore his problem was your problem, and the curse of sin has been inherited by you, and you have fallen short of the glory of God, and you're infested and infected with sin because sin has been passed on to you through original sin and you were born into this world a sinner and you've offended God with your sin. And that you made a freedom of choice in the garden because you would have done what he did and because of that, you cannot explain away evil. I've written down what Randy Alcorn has said. Listen to it. This is a synopsis of it. He said, the Bible attributes the origin of human evil to people's choices. When we choose to disobey God and his standards, it inevitably, inevitably brings suffering. To argue that God should not permit Evil or suffering is to argue against human beings having real choice or to insist that our choices have no consequences. The problem is e of evil, therefore, is the problem of freedom. Without freedom, there could be no evil. Listen to also what he said. God isn't the author of evil, but he's the author of a story that includes evil. He intended from the, from the beginning to permit evil, then turn evil on its head to take fallen angels and fallen people intended for evil and use it for good. In the face of the worst wrongs, God always reveals his highest good. That's why we can say God is good and all the time. So therefore, they, he dealt with this problem theologically. Not only he dealt with a problem theologically called theodicy, but he dealt with a problem theologically about his prayer life. Look at verse 2. You'll find that he questioned God twice. He said, how long? And then he questions God by saying, how? How can you allow this to happen? You say, well, what was happening? Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. But he's really saying, God, really, Lord, I'm wrestling with the fact that prayer doesn't seem to be effective. Now, we know God answers prayers in three ways. Yes, no, no. Wait. Somebody said there was a fourth. You got to be kidding. But anyway, God, God does answer prayer. Amen? In other words, God is a God who answers prayer. But God answers prayer according to his will. And God has a way of communicating with us. And we, when we struggle, let's just face it, we struggle sometimes theologically. Secondly, he struggled with his nation politically. That's why Cyril Barber in his commentary says that Abaca is a parallel to the United States of America. If you read verses 3 and 4, here's how it reads. He says that in his country at this time, lawsuits are rampant. Court cases are settled and the evil and the rich prosper and the poor are being taken advantage of. In fact, he said in verse 4 that the law is numb, paralyzed, ineffective, and the law seems to be geared toward those judges who make judgments that are ungodly. Let me tell you the atmosphere of the country. Let me give you a little history. 
from 640 to 609, Josiah was king. Now, what age was he when he became king? He was eight years of age. Isn't that encouraging to a child here this morning? Eight years of age and you're king. So in 640, he became king at the age of eight. 621, mark that, 621, they were working in the temple and they discovered the word of God. At the age of 27, 640 to 621, 19 years, he was eight years of age, eight plus 19 is 27. At the age of 27, he declared revival in the country. He tore down all the idols and he established righteousness and he said we're gonna have judges that decide judgment based on the law and we're gonna have a nation that functions correctly and everybody's somebody and Jesus Christ died for all. He was a man who established in the nation righteousness as the law. But then in 609, At the age of 39, he dies. He got tired of paying taxes to the Egyptian king. And he went to war and he was defeated and he was killed. One of his sons became king for three months. But he was not the ruler that the Egyptians wanted and so Jehoiakim became king. Let me tell you about Jehoiakim. If you want to read about him, read Jeremiah 22 through 26. Jehoiakim was as wicked as a man could be. In fact, history records that Jehoiakim hated God and hated God's man, hated his daddy. He tore down everything that his daddy had ever done and now he's king. And Habakkuk, Habakkuk is now during the rule of Jehoiakim He's struggling with what's happening in his nation. I'll tell you how mean Jehoiakim was. He killed a prophet. He took Jeremiah and put him in prison. And when Jeremiah read his first scroll, he said to him, I'll not have the word of God around me. I don't want to hear what the Bible has to say. So he struggled politically. He struggled socially. Injustice, crime, it was rampant. This is a man wrestling. What amazes me is we're insensitive. Because America only glories in the covetousness of prosperity because it's the God of this country. And it seems like as long as the economy is doing good, we think that we as a nation don't need revival. And the very fabric of this country is coming apart at the seams. And you'll find that there's not many people today really wrestling with the vision like Habakkuk did. Because here's how most Old Testament prophets, in fact, here's how all Old Testament prophets actually function. They got a word from God and gave it to the people, correcting the people. That's not Habakkuk. Habakkuk goes to God and says, God, you're the problem. You're indifferent. You're inactive. You're not up to anything. You've let our country go to the dogs. What are you doing? God, it seems like you're lax. You're not doing what you should do. He wrestled with it. He questioned God. In fact, you'll find that Habakkuk was bent out of shape. And his problem was not so much 
the injustice. His problem was that he didn't think that God was up to the task. I can tell this sermon's going over good. Because a lot of us, if we're honest, I mean, when we have somebody who's respectable and a TV evangelist said that we're now ushering in the greatest movement of God that's ever been in this country, somebody must have their head in the ditch. Let me get to my second point because it gets better. Amen? I want you to see that he now has to embrace the victory. Now look at verse 5. Let me paraphrase it for you. Okay, Habakkuk, I've listened to you. I'm going to tell you what I'm doing. You've accused me of being inactive. You've accused me of not working. By the way, Henry Blackaby's correct. God's always working. History is God's story. God has written history before it ever, ever occurs. Has it ever, ever come to your recollection and to your thinking? There's not a sparrow that falls. There's not a hair on your head. There's not a whisker that you have that God doesn't know everything about you. And there's not anything about you that God has not arranged or allowed in this world, that this is my father's world, that even though there's evil and it seems like the devil's the god of this age and the prince and the power of the air, he is just really an errant boy and God really is in charge. He's never, he's never, he's never come off the throne. He's still on the throne and God has a plan and God has a man, but God's gonna accomplish his will. Because here's what Habakkuk said. God, you're not doing anything. Look at verse five. He said, I'm gonna tell you what I'm doing, but it's gonna blow your socks off. It's gonna, it's gonna cause you to live, in, to live in a whirlwind. In fact, what you're gonna do is you're gonna get upset with me when I tell you what I'm doing. Look at verse six. I'm raising up the Babylonians. Oh, who are the Babylonians? Well, I'm glad you asked. God used the Assyrians to take care of the northern kingdom in 722. He would raise up the Babylonians to defeat the Egyptians in 605. But listen, it's coming down the highway here because this was probably written or given to Habakkuk about 598. And so what he says is, the Babylonians, I've raised them up and they're gonna come into Jerusalem in 586, and they're going to destroy the country. God, I accused you of being indifferent and inactive. Now you've lost your mind. You have lost your mind. Because here's the reasoning. How can you take a nation more wicked than our nation and destroy our nation? How can you take a wicked nation like the Babylonians? If you start reading verse 7, they're like a lion that gets the prey in their mouth and fires them. They're like a swift gazelle. They flow through a country. They devastate. They burn everything. They rape women. They kill children. How can you allow a nation like that? to destroy us. There's three things or four I want to share with you and I'll be finished. What is God saying to Habakkuk? It's what he's saying to us today. You don't sin and get by with it. You don't kill babies and get by with it. You don't murder babies after they're born and get by with it. You don't decide that the LGBTQ movement is acceptable in this country and get by with it. You don't pass laws that 
you think are acceptable when it goes against my laws. I've given you my laws and my laws override any of your thoughts, any of your thinking. Don't you think you can be a Christian and ignore me and not have a quiet time? Don't you think that you can neglect me and not spend time with me? Don't you think that you can get sin in your life and not deal with it on a daily basis? Don't you think that you can go to the cross where Jesus died in glory, but you don't pick up your cross and deny yourself? Don't you think for a moment that you can get by with your sin, no matter who you are? Because sin must and always will be judged by God. If you're without chastisement, listen folks, the number one reason I know I'm saved, I can sin and enjoy it for a moment, but I can't get by with it. God has a way of dealing with us. You say, well, preacher, if God lives on the inside, are you troubled most of the time? Yes, I am. I'm troubled about me. I found out since I've been saved that God's knocking me out of me. I found out that since I've been saved that I'm my problem. I find out that I look where I should not look. I say what I should not say. I think what I should not think. I choose what I should not choose. And if it wasn't for the mercy and grace of God, I'd be consumed right here, right now, because God is gonna always, always judge sin. And anybody that says anything else is not telling you the truth. Anybody that says to you that you can sin and it's all right as a Christian, I got news for you, it's not all right. And we need a revival of repentance toward God because God's chastening hand is inevitable. Intervention is sure. Here's what Cyril Barber says. He said, the Lord informed his servant in verse five that far from being indifferent to the events and circumstances surrounding his people, He's going to chastise them. Now the intervention is sure. But the second thing I want to say is the instrument is surprising. Let's compare this to America. It's as if he would say to America, you're not going to like this. China's going to take over America. Well, that's what Habakkuk received. Your country will be no longer. For 70 years, you're going into captivity. So you think you're above that. God always surprises us with the instruments that he uses to correct us. For some of you, it's who you're married to. You've been driving each other to Jesus ever since you've been married. For some of you, it's your boss at work. I mean, if you were just the boss man or the boss woman, it wouldn't be that way. For some of you, it's the children God gave you. You say, well, my children have risen up and called me blessed. Mine's risen up and called me collect. Listen, it's a... (laughs) I'm just telling you, God, God uses the people that mean the most to us to humble us. Some of you haven't lived long enough to see that. But you will. How do I wrap this up? Let's get the picture. I want to make sure I preach clearly what the Bible teaches. Because the best thing you could say about me this morning is not that I had some humor and not that I was bold, 
the best thing you could say about me is I said what the Bible said. Did you know Habakkuk 2.4 is quoted in Galatians, Hebrews, and Romans? It's quoted in Galatians 3.11. It's quoted in Romans 1.17. And it's quoted in Hebrews 10.38. And that verse says that you live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Habakkuk 1 5 is quoted in the book of Acts. Habakkuk verses 16 and 17 of chapter 3 will be quoted in Philippians. And so you're going to find that the just shall live. All right, let me just define faith. Let's define faith. Faith is my response to what God initiates by his word. Faith cometh by. So faith's not something you do and you ask God to bless it. Faith is your response to what God reveals. Now what is God revealed? God revealed that I'm raising up the Babylonians and they're going to destroy the country. Now how am I to respond to that? Look at chapter 3 verse 2. Here's how he walks through it. By the time he gets to chapter 3, here's what Weirdsby says happens. Weirdsby says he starts out worrying and wondering in chapter 1. He comes to chapter 2 and he's waiting and he's watching to hear from God. He hears from God in chapter 2 verse 4. In fact, you study beginning at verse 5 and he says, i got a plan for the Babylonians. I'm raising up another country. Cyprus and the Persians and, and, and they're going to destroy the Babylonians and they're going to do that real soon in about 537. So don't you think I hadn't got a plan for them too. Don't you think I hadn't got a plan for every nation that does evil. Don't you think I hadn't got a plan for every person who thinks that sin is something you can get by with because I got a plan and I'm going to accomplish my will. Look with me at verse 2. O Lord, I heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. Let me paraphrase it. God, when I heard what you told me, it upset me. In fact, I was afraid for my people and for my nation. But now, God, I've come to the place in my life that you've told me what your will is and you're going to chastise us. He said, get with it. Revive your work. What work is it? Go back to verse 5 of chapter 1. He was working a work of chastisement. He's saying now in chapter 3, verse 2, go for it. Oh, that doesn't sound right, preacher. Well, let's just read verse 2, all of it. Revive thy work in the midst of the years and in the midst of the years make known. In wrath, remember mercy. Bring your wrath on, but in the midst of it, please God, please God, would you remember your promises to David in 2 Samuel 7 that the nation of Israel would eventually be the nation that you bless in the future. God, would you promise God, would you promise to fulfill what you said to Abraham in Genesis 12 through 17 that you made a covenant? You made a covenant with David. You made a covenant with Abraham. Surely you're not through with us yet. I love Oswald Chambers. Oswald Chambers said this way, this in my devotions. This week, here's what he said. God's always, 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 always calling us to give up a right to ourselves. And you'll never give up the right to yourself until you give up the right to tell God what to do. You don't have that right. The only right you have is to submit to whatever God says. 
Now, how do I know that Habakkuk's a changed man and he submitted to what he didn't like and he was willing to surrender to it? Look at verse number 16. He's an honest man. He said, when I heard, you know he was a Baptist, he had a belly, my belly trembled. My lips quivered. Rottenness entered into my bones. That's a good way of saying I hurt all over. I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he cometh up unto the people, he will invade them with his troops. Verse 17, although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall the fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olives shall fail. In other words, I go to the grocery store, there's no bread, and it's not snowing. There's no milk. The stock, mar the stock market has absolutely been straight line. The economy is devastated. Verse 18. My confidence is not in my nation. My joy is not in what I have. I will rejoice in thee. Because you've dismantled me to realize that you're all I need. He'll never be all you need till he's all you got. I'm not a prophet. And anybody who says they are are lying to you. But I'm here to tell you, you judge your sin or God will judge it. And in this morning's message, I'm so grateful that in the midst of his wrath, he not only remembers mercy, but he extends grace. I'm glad that he's the God of new beginnings. And if we'll repent, we might find mercy in the eyes of God. And he might restore our nation. He might revive his church. He might renew us with a clean and a contrite heart. He might do a work in us that only God can do and God knows there's still enough salt and enough light. Because in my travels around the world, here's what I've seen. You take American church mission money out of the world. And evangelism would be stifled and hurt. And even as wicked as we are, we belong to him. And if we'll repent, he might give us back the years the locusts have eaten. If we'll truly her. Can I ask you a question and I'm finished? Do you wrestle? Are you troubled about our nation? Why not embrace the victory that we have in Christ today? You say, how can I do that? Well, if you're not saved, you ought to be saved. 
I'm glad we have a pastor that says you can know Christ and you can have a personal relationship with the living God. But then, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and repent and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear their prayer and heal their land. As long as you think the answer is in D.C. instead of J.C., you've missed it. You're the key that unlocks a move of God. But the key is a repentant heart. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.